This is a, a weird intro to make, really. Um, Clinton is pretty well known in uh, the Python community, in particular in the open source community within Australia. He's a sucker for running uh, community open source conferences and events. Um, I don't think you need much more of an intro than that, do you? Okay. Please make him feel welcome. All right. How are we going on the volume there? Is that good? Excellent. Um, so this talk is excellent. Those Slack notifications are not coming up on the big display. Sweet. Um, so this talk is very much aimed at people who are programming and have not come at it from an academic background. So they might not have come across the concept of state machines. So this is not an academic talk. This is very much trying to introduce the concept of state machines from a practical point of view. Um, are there any functional programmers in the house? All right. I'm watching. <laughs> so please feel free to ask questions um, throughout, and I will just repeat the questions. And if I don't repeat the questions to the recording, yell at me. So um, there are very precise mathematical definitions for what a state machine is. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, a state machine is any uh, program that has a variable that you change the contents of. Um, which basically means any programs that do anything useful at all are going to be state machines. There's different ways of thinking about programs and state machines is another tool that you can have for solving particular problems. And like any tool, they're very good at solving particular problems and very bad at solving other problems. And hopefully at the end of this talk, you'll have some idea of when it might be a good idea to use state machines. So if you want to think about your programs from a methodical uh, state machine point of view, you can get the benefits of thinking about them um, in a very explicit way. What are the exact states my machine can get in? And how can my program uh, transition between those states? Um, state machines model life cycles really well. So a typical life, uh, life cycle model that you get in a lot of programs is you create your model, you do things, uh, sorry, you create your object, you do some things on your object, you pass some messages to it, and then you destroy your model. You allocate your memory before you do some things with your memory, then you free your memory. And those things have to happen in a certain order, otherwise it doesn't make sense. If your um, object has that sort of life cycle, a state machine can be a very good way of modeling it. Every time I move, that jumps. One of the really nice things with state machines is when you're analyzing a problem, if you think that it can be modeled well with a state machine and then you can implement it with a state machine, you've got nice traceability from your analysis all the way through to your implementation. One of the really nice things with explicit state machines is that if you're adding new states and new transitions, your um, toolkit can handle um, adding that new state and those new transitions without you having to go and check all of your previous states and transitions. The particular library that made me interested in doing this talk is Automat. Um, it's written by Glyph, who's the main guy behind the Twisted framework. Um, they're starting to use it in more and more Twisted code. Uh, in networking, you have lots of state machines. I've got a socket. I've connected it to my server. I know the connection's gone away. I'm now in, a, now in a disconnected but trying to reconnect state. I've now reconnected. And in that time, there's been a queue of messages that I've been trying to send along. Those sort of state machines are littered all over the twisted code base 
but in a very unstructured way. And it means that there were bugs. The other nice thing about Automat is that the objects that it helps you create are plain Python objects that look like plain Python objects when you're using them. Your users don't have to know that you've used this Automat state machine library at all. Can everyone see the kettle? Good. So we're going to model a kettle. It's got a small number of states and a small number of transitions. So you've got an empty kettle. You've got a full kettle. It's full of cold water. And you've got a full kettle that's full of hot water. So we're going to model three states in our system. I'm not going to say non-empty, all right? It's going to go with full. You've got transitions between these states. So you take your empty kettle, you fill it up with cold water, um, then you boil it, and then it's got full of hot water, and then you pour it out and you're back to the empty state. So if you think of these three states as your um, entire state machine, you can think about it as having uh, three different inputs. So your entire state machine, you can fill it up, the kettle, you can boil the kettle, and you can pour the kettle out. So that is the um, entire model that the rest of the talk is based on. Um, so I've tried to keep it nice and simple so that we can follow it along. Um, so try and keep that model in your head. So those are the, the three states and the three inputs to our state machine and our three transitions. So if I was to have a quick hack at writing the code to handle that, the first thing that I might do in our initialization is have some state variables, whether or not the kettle is full and whether or not the kettle is hot. I've got my three inputs, the fill, the boil, and the pour. And I've got some if code at the boil. I want to make sure that there's water in the kettle before you boil it. And when I pour it, it's got to be full of hot water, otherwise there's no point. The advantages of using um, a explicit methodical state machine is that all of that if checking code goes away and you don't have to implement that. You just have to think about what to do from this state to get into this other state. Um, so there, there, I've put at least one bug in there. Can anyone spot it? And it's a state talk, so it might have something to do with the state handling. Um, yes. So I am not resetting the state when I pour. So I need to set the full back to false. I need to set the hot back to false. And I need to potentially set the amount back to zero. So this kettle here would be good for like one use and then basically have to throw it out. Um, the state handling um, machine will cover all of those bases for you. So using Automat, how do we code the same thing? So um, we import one class, um, the methodical machine. We have our kettle. And as an internal implementation variable, we have a methodical machine. So the, it's reference, it's named with an underscore. So it's private, it's internal, it's for the implementation only. It's not for other people to see. We would next model our three states. And the way we do that is by using the uh, decorator of state. Um, the states themselves don't really have any implementation associated with it. It's just a way of referencing the states further on. The only special one here is the first machine state uh, empty. And we say that, we say that that's the, the start state. That's the initial equals true. So in the state machine, at all points in time, you always have a known state. And that's the start state. 
we've got the three inputs. So fill, boil, and pour. Again, we don't have any implementation on here. The implementation that the state machine library gives us is all of that checking code at the start. So if we had um, code in here, we would have to somehow get the generated test code and align it with our um, implementation code. So these inputs, you can treat those as messages that get sent to your object, and you can't put any implementation detail here. Um, this is where things start getting interesting, and this is where we're doing the transitions. So this is where we are wiring up our states that we've created with our inputs. And the comment at the top is the, um, uh, is the template that we're following here. So from a start state, we take an input and we end in a finishing state. So from the empty state, um, we take a fill input and we enter the full cold state. From the full cold state, we take a boil input and we enter the full hot. And from the full hot, we take a pour input and we go back to empty. Those transitions are the only transitions that the state machine uh, will let us have. If a user tries to do anything outside of those, it'll throw an error for us. So we don't have to do any checking around that. And because, we don't, because we're not allowed to put any implementation code in any of those inputs, um, if they call boil before the kettle is full, it won't do anything. Any questions? So now that we've implemented um, our very simple kettle, this is how we'd use it. And as on the bottle, um, sorry, as on the box, it is a plain Python object. So we um, instantiate our kettle, we fill it, we boil it, we pour it, and when we run that, no errors. So that state, um, those transitions that we've done in our state machine are valid according to our model. If we try to run it in a different way, so we instantiate our kettle, and the initial state of the kettle is empty, and then we go straight to boiling it, we know that that's invalid because we haven't filled it with any water. And that results in an exception. And I've cleaned up some of the exception just for uh, readability purposes. But the exception is saying that from the kettle.empty state on the, on the last line, there's no valid transition to get to the boil state, uh, to get to the, the uh, full hot state. And all of that was done without us having to write any test code to make sure we're in the right state and getting the right inputs. So all of the previous stuff was the really nice, easy, Pythonic stuff. The drama is when you actually want to do stuff, it starts to become slightly less Pythonic. So if you actually want to do stuff, you have to call out to um, output functions. Output functions um, actually modify the state um, in your class, and they will get called when the state machine uh, library is happy that the transition that um, the user is asking for is valid. So um, it's a plain Python object, and all of our inputs, we want to be able to pass parameters along. So for the fill, we want to be able to pass along an amount of cold water that we want to put into the kettle. And the obvious thing to do is that we want to say self water equals amount. We can't, if we did that on the, um, if we did that in the input itself, someone could call that input. It would, um, in an empty, yeah, that's not the best example there actually. Um, if, if the kettle was already full and somebody called fill, we would save the water and then the state machine stuff would figure out that we were in the wrong state. So that's why we can't do any code 
um, any working code in the input. All of the working stuff, all of our uh, business logic has to be in one of the outputs. So it's very simple to wire that save water function in and it's the same state transition as before. So when we're empty and we receive a fill, we enter the full cold state and we run the save water function. And that will just mean that uh, save water gets run once machine input is validated as being correct. And also when we want to um, have a plain old Python object, we want functions that return things. And this is also another use of the outputs. So when we want to, um, when we are pouring out our kettle, we want the uh, amount of water that we put in right at the start to be the result of that. And this is a way of doing that. So it's exactly the same state transition as before. So from the full state, when we have a pour input, we go to the empty state and we run the output function return water. And all of that does is return self.water. The yucky aspect of this is that we have an output function that accepts parameters. We have an output function that returns things. If we want a function that, um, if we want a function that takes arguments and returns results, which is quite a reasonable thing to do in a Python program, that necessarily means that you're going to have to have multiple outputs. So outputs is always a list, which means that um, you are going to have to um, handle the fact that your returns can be a list. There, is, there are ways of um, hiding that fact, but that's slightly advanced and I'm going to leave that alone. So with those output functions, um, and I'm going to call this kettle two, we instantiate the kettle we fill it with half a litre of water, we boil it, um, then we pour it and we get the result back. And the, 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 there's two output functions there. There's one at fill, which will store that 0.5, and there's one at pour, which will return that 0.5. And because outputs is a list, your result um, at the moment is always a list of results. You can tell um, Automat to do funky things on the return list and change it so that if you've got a list of results, only return like the first non-empty one or return the last one. But it starts to get a bit hairy and it's not a good uh, topic for an introductory talk. But what we have here is we've got a state machine that is taking input and giving output as a, a plain Python object and all the state transitions are checked by something else. Um, Automat has some quite advanced features um, that you can use for some other things. Um, you can serialize the state machine. So Automat is kind of interesting in that it doesn't like you asking what state the machine is in. It sort of considers that internal state um, and it's hidden from you. But a good example for when you might want to serialize a state machine is some sort of uh, commercial uh, sale object. So someone logs into a website, um, their previous login, they might have had a cart that they've added some objects to. You pull that state machine out of the database, deserialize it, plunk it in your web server, and they might continue adding things to the cart, removing things to the cart adding vouchers, you can tell my conference organizer, um, and doing all those sort of things. And then they might log out again, at which point you take that state machine, serialize it, put it back in the database. One of the other interesting things that Automat has some rudimentary support for is automatically generating visualizations of your state machine. So instead of um, you having to uh, pull out Visio or Inkscape or whatever to draw diagrams, from your code, it will generate diagrams not dissimilar to the ones that I started with. So that's the, the project URL for Automat. Uh, 
it's a nice, clean, simple way for doing most of your state machine stuff. Um, there's quite a, f quite a number of features down there at the moment that, th that they're looking at adding, but essentially it's a complete project. Um, so I am open to questions now. Uh, thanks for the talk, it was excellent, really interesting. Um, in a lot of real-world state machines, such as a kettle, if you were to actually try and control a kettle, there's a time delay in terms of when you, set, you say, I want to be in this state, yep. to when that state actually occurs yep. inside the state machine. Yep. Does this library have um, anything wrapped up around the difference between the desired state and the actual state? Um, no, you would, have to, you would have to use... So the way that I think that they would ask you to model that is you can have two state machines that you can hook up. And the outputs from one state machine can be, become the inputs to the next state machine. So that's probably what I would suggest. Hi. Um, one of the things I like about the way I write state machines, at least, is that I can keep the, um, the uh, functions that belong to a particular state with the code for yep. that particular state. This kind of seems to, from what I could get from that, you, you probably could, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't enforce it in any way. Um, no, it's, it's very much, um, it is very much a, a Pythonic approach to, to dealing with it. So it doesn't um, force you to, to, do, to do any sort of code um, manipulations to, to keep things together like that. Um, it's very possible for you to spread a state machine implementation across multiple files, across multiple classes. That's, that's a definite thing. Don't do that. Okay. Um, in the real world, kettles aren't always empty or full. How do you deal with the continuous domain rather than discrete? So that's a good example where... Um, a state machine might not be a good uh, tool to model a continuous um, environment. So um, a slightly more correct way might be to say that it's a non-empty state and that that has an amount associated with it. So not full. Yeah, exactly. I wasn't going to stand up here and say not full, though I was going to go with full and empty. Yeah. But um, it, it, it raises a good example. This is a tool. It's applicable for a lot of things. It's not applicable for a lot of things as well. Hi, uh, thank you. Um, so it looks like the arguments of the input get passed to the arguments of the output yep. functions. So, for instance, a sensible thing to do, I would think, would be when you're pouring the kettle to reuse the save water function to set the water to zero. Can you do things like that? Like, could you pass a constant value of zero yep. into that um, function? In that for that input? You could pro yeah, you could almost certainly do that. You could probably do it with like, um, like you'd make a, a partial um, with a, a value of zero and pass that through. Yeah, yeah for okay. sure. Anyone else? Uh, can you deal with um, hierarchical state machines? With um, there's no explicit support for that. Um, but um, again, there's reasonable support for hooking together different state machines. So um, I suspect um, that the answer to that would be for the substates, have, a, have our own, have a, a separate state machine and use the initial state and the accepting state as inputs back to the main machine. Okay, cool. Any more questions? If not, please join me in thanking Clinton. Thank you.